councillors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I call the meeting to order, please? Um, first of all, let me welcome those brave souls of you who have turned out on a rather chilly evening this evening. Uh, you are very welcome. I hope the church is warm enough. Maybe we'll break for uh, PT halfway through or something like that if it's not. Um, now, I uh, am the independent chair of the meeting for this evening uh, at the invitation of a council officer. Um, and I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I think I know many of you, uh, but for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Roger Mason, and I'm uh, a long-term resident of Kew. I've lived here since 1974, so I've seen many changes uh, go on in the ward during that uh, uh, time. Uh, currently, I am chair of the Kew Society, which is a, an amenity society of some 780 members who live in and around Kew. Uh, we're very concerned with community affairs. Uh, we uh, uh, organize events for our members. We uh, scrutinize planning applications and uh, respond to them where necessary. Uh, we're very keen on the, preserving the environment, particularly in places like uh, the riverbank, for example, our historic riverbank, uh, and we undertake gardening to uh, uh, beautify uh, the area of Kew. Uh, many of you will have seen the little notices uh, in the beds on the station, for instance, which have been replanted a couple of years ago, and now I think look uh, wonderful compared to the way they used to be. So. Uh, a little bit of advertising. May I encourage uh, any of you who are not members of the Q Society, if you're interested in the community, and uh, clearly you all are because you wouldn't be here otherwise, uh, please uh, join up. Um, now, uh, I need uh, next to introduce our councillors to you. I'm sure many of you know them already. Uh, on my left is Councillor J.F. Burford. Uh, on my right is uh, Councillor Lottie Campanari, and beyond her, Councillor Ian Craigie. So, uh, welcome, councillors. Although I believe officially you are actually the hosts of the meeting tonight. <laughs> so, uh, my second task is, uh, with respect to councillors, to ask are there any other councillors in the audience who come uh, from other wards? And if so, please identify yourselves. No, there are not. So uh, we'll pass on that one. Um, now, what is the purpose of this meeting? Well, the council uh, is committed to uh, working with the community and for those who live in the community to be able to have their say uh, about community affairs. So this evening is an opportunity uh, for you to ask questions of our councillors, uh, to also uh, tell them what you think the priorities uh, should be in the ward, and we're going to talk a little bit about ward funding, to tell them what you think the priorities should be for the spending of uh, ward funds. Um, what's my role here this evening? Well, first of all, uh, to ensure that the programme runs uh, to time. I'll tell you a little about the programme in a minute. Uh, and to make sure that everybody who uh, wants to have a say actually gets a chance to have their say. And to ensure that uh, uh, no one topic, or for that matter, person, uh, dominates the uh, proceedings to the exclusion of other people. I need at this point to make the point that um, this uh, meeting is a non-political meeting. So I ask you to keep to that principle. Um, if it should at any time become political, then I will step in and remind you uh, that uh, we should not be having a political meeting. This is a community meeting uh, for everybody. A few practical points. 
Uh, first of all, the fire exits. Um, there are fire exits over here, over here, and at the back of the church on each side uh, with green signs on them. Uh, I'm pretty sure we won't have to use them, but uh, you must know where they are. Um, another practical point, the toilets are out of the door on uh, the far side there. Just walk down the passageway, you will find the toilets behind there. Um, another practical point, please use the microphone when you're asking a question. Uh, it's essential that we do this not only so that we can all hear one another here, but also because uh, this meeting is being filmed. And if you don't use the microphone, uh, then your uh, statement or question will not actually be adequately recorded for the uh, film. When you use the microphone, there's a roving microphone, please hold it up to the face like an ice cream cornet. There's no point holding it down here, because if you do, it won't fulfill its function. So hold it up to your mouth and speak into it. Uh, yes, final administrative point. Sign the register, please, which is by the front door and will be available during the course of the evening. Now, I just need to say a few words about the program. Uh, we uh, officially kicked off at 6.30 and refreshed ourselves with tea. And I don't know whether all of you are aware there was a board over there where you could post some points if you wish to make them about Q and what is happening. There's also a map of the uh, ward where you can identify places where you think uh, projects should be undertaken. Uh, if you missed that, we'll go back to that at the end of the meeting anyway. Uh, after my introduction, uh, I shall be asking uh, uh, Councillor Burford to uh, review achievements uh, of the councillors in queue in recent times since the last meeting. Then we'll move on to a session of pre-submitting questions, questions that people have sent in, uh, and uh, answer those. Uh, then subsequently after that, I'll throw the floor open to anybody who wants to ask a question from the floor. So you don't have to have written in. If you feel moved suddenly to ask a question uh, during the course of that session, Please identify yourself by standing up and uh, saying who you are and then asking the question. Please keep your question short. Um, please, as I say, identify yourself and ask a question, not give a speech. Uh, sometimes happens on these occasions. Uh, then after those questions, we will have a short session where Councillor Ian Craigie is going to talk about ward budgets. And then we'll move back to the exhibition at the back of the room. So I think that's uh, all I have to say uh, now. And we'll move on to uh, JF, who's going to tell us uh, initially uh, about a uh, review of achievements by councillors. Roger, thank you. Um, so I'm not going to talk too long because this is a community conversation and it's not really for us to talk to you. We want to hear from you as to what you've got to say, which is far more important. So just uh, really briefly, I suppose the biggest thing and uh, one of the biggest votes that uh, this ward did compared to any other wards was 20 miles an hour. So you guys voted more than any other ward for 20 miles an hour and that is going to be brought in and uh, that's coming up later. We also, the signage on the Mortlake Road, we know that there are issues on the Mortlake Road with big trucks coming on and we all know how difficult it is to negotiate with TfL. Well, TfL have agreed to put new signage up and we, they are late in doing that, I think, but that's coming fairly shortly. Um, so that's good. We know there is loads of rubbish all the time in uh, Kew Village because of the events that go down uh, to Kew Gardens and we've had extra bins and we are continually cleaning Q Village. It may not look like it, but we've introduced extra bins and 
form of what well, are they see-through bins or something see-through bins or something like that very modern so we've introduced those um, we're also working on um, Q Green, and I know Q Green, and again it's coming up, but very briefly, CPZs around Q Green, so we're working on that. Uh, we're working on, uh, I know our, um, our telecoms isn't very good uh, around here, and it depends if you're with O2 or EE, or it depends whether you get sight or signal or not. So again, we're working on that. So there's loads of things that we're working towards. Sandicum Road, again, there's loads of issues around Sandicum Road with speeding, uh, speeding traffic as we, if those who, who live in Sandicum Road. So we're working uh, with the council to um, monitor and change the signage because the signage at one end of Sandicum Road and the other end of Sandicum Road were completely different. So again, we've managed to get those signs to actually be the same for once. So if you were coming up from the, uh, Kew Gardens Road, you were giving a different uh, weight restriction compared to if you were coming from Manor Circus. So again, I think that's been, uh, that's been looked at. Uh, we know we're looking at red and yellow, uh, the new development in uh, Kew Riverside, that's coming up, ULES is coming up. Uh, for us, which is the ultra low emission zone, so we're looking at all of those sort of things as well. Um, helping our shops in Kew Village, uh, so we always promote our shops and small shops and, uh, and trying to uh, get uh, Kew Village to be better than it actually is in terms of um, what it looks like. So we're perpetually talking to, to officers about that. Apart from potholes, which we look after, uh, um, pavements, which we're perpetually asked about, and trees which we are perpetually asked about. I got an email again uh, this morning about the trees on the Q Road. So again, we look after all of that and we're monitoring all of that. Um, and that's about all I've really got to say because I want to listen to what you've got to say and then we can answer uh, questions. And I think it's uh, more fruitful that I know what you're thinking and not what uh, I'm thinking or what we're thinking. So I know I had 20 minutes, but I don't think you want to listen to me for 20 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Burford. Um, do either Councillor Campanelli or Councillor Craigie have anything to add to that? Um, I, would, I would add that we have a new business opening soon. There's a new gluten-free restaurant opening on Sandicum Road, I believe. Um, and on the matter of trees, we have successfully um, got RHP, Richmond Housing Trust Partnership, to um, uh, take down some dangerous Leylandi trees and I have just had an email this afternoon saying that they have got the funding and the okay to do that which is um, going to appease quite a lot of residents in one road um, and I, I agree with Councillor Burford that I would rather spend the time answering your questions and at, at the end we can sing our praises if you wish but I would rather listen to what the community has to ask us. Councillor Craig. No, indeed. Let's um, have to move on to the questions, and if, as things arise, feel free to throw questions at us. Okay, thank you very much, councillors. Um, we're five minutes in hand already. <laughs> so that's a satisfactory state of affairs for the chairman, if no one else. Uh, right, so at this stage, uh, we, uh, we move on to the pre submitted questions, and uh, we have about uh, six of those. Um, the first one is from Matthew Dodd. Is Matthew Dodd in the audience? No. Uh, well, perhaps I will read uh, his question in that case. Um, uh, Matthew Dodd has asked, apart from recent upsurge in crime, uh, I'm very taken aback by the volume of illegal parking in Kew Village. It amazes me that a CCTV camera can't not be installed and give people immediate fines for double parking. Um, and then a, a, a secondary part to the question, with the recent murder, knife stabbing and other theft in queue, uh, I'm sure a tragic accident is waiting to happen. Uh, and I think, uh, Councillor Campanile, you're going to lead on this one, please. Thank you. Um, so there are two parts the, to this question, the, um, the parking fines and, and the dangerous parking in queue. Um, the answer is that really the traffic wardens should be dealing with the fining and the illegal parking. Um, and you're probably, I don't know if you're aware, but the traffic wardens are now also empowered to fine for idling. 
Um, and so that there's going to be a big push when 20 miles an hour comes in, there will be a big, big presence of traffic wardens. So as we're quite lucky in that 20 miles an hour is being implemented in Kew and Barnes first, so we will get that first push of present traffic wardens. So what I'd like to do is, is make sure that they also push on the illegal parking. Um, and I know it's a huge problem. In fact, we all had a meeting with Royal Botanic Gardens last week um, about the parking issue, particularly around the Kew Road area, and that we are working collectively with them on that. And in fact, I had took some photographs just yesterday of, of a classic example of lots of double yellow line parking. So we are keeping an eye on it. We are watching it. It can be fined. The idea of, of fine by um, uh, camera is, is possible. I know they use it in Kingston and I've been done in that yellow box in Kingston. Um, the, my, my issue with cameras is you go one way or the other, and this is leading into the answer about the crime, is we either become like 1984 and you have them everywhere or you have them in select places. We do have cameras in select places and they are working in Kew Village um, and they are, we can request more, um, but uh, you've, you, it's a kind of all or nothing. You've either got to have them everywhere um, and the chances of them capturing the specific crime incidents is pretty minimal. That doesn't, of course, stop people installing their own cameras in their own homes, their own shops, their own, um, you know. So there's a bit of a debate around how far we go with the camera thing. Um, but obviously when 20 miles an hour is implemented, that will be another opportunity to revisit the cameras. Um, and on the, leading on from the crime, I mean, we, we have a, an excellent working relationship with our local police. Um, Jordan, Lorraine and Jim and the, the again crime of being recorded on camera is, is helpful but we need people to report crime please please ring 101 please dial 999 please report crime it's no good putting it on the neighbourhood forum that is not reporting the crime if we don't report the crime we don't get the back we, we, we don't get the statistics to get the back up um, and the other thing, I'd, the last thing I'd like to say is, well, we also have a, a, um, a crime a community safety officer at the council in David Noakes, who is spe specifically responsible for Q, who we've also met with, and we are all on the ball with what's going on. Um, and also, when there are major incidents, we are all informed now. I have, have made improvements to the system of communication from the, within the council when there is a major incident. So we have learned from the recent um, incidents, um, and they are unusual. I think that's the point to remember, is that the, the recent incidents are, are unusual. Crime stats are still generally not too bad here. I know those anyone who's been on the receiving end of any of those crimes, and members of my family have, um, it, it, you know, that doesn't help much. Um, but it is a point. And the other thing is, in recognition of the police cuts from central government, government uh, Richmond Council has just um, donated £100,000 <coughs> towards local policing. Um, I think, I think we've covered it. Mm, no, I think you've covered it. Could, could, could I just say, I think you made an extremely important point about re reporting crime. Um, I, I'm guilty of this myself. A few months ago, my car, which is parked on our front, was opened electronically, and some trivial stuff was taken from it. It was really trivial, but it was an auto crime. And uh, I just said, oh, and uh, took some measures that it wouldn't happen again, like uh, taking my car keys away from a place where they could be accessed electronically. Um, so subsequently talking to our police constables, uh, I realized how uh, I should have actually reported that crime uh, because Q, they tell me, is rated as a highly safe place. Well, it's safe only as long as we don't report the crimes that take place. So I admit to, you know, my error and ask you all to report crimes. Um, yes, a uh, point. Can I? We've got a microphone, please. Robert Smith. Thank you. 
I can just about see you in the middle, Robert. <laughs> Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's working now. Um, Roger, you mentioned about reporting crime. On Saturday night, my next door neighbour had four masked and hooded people coming into her house. She dialed 999 and the police did not respond. Do the Arthur Councillors aware of that? It was, it was number one Chelmer Gardens. I am very concerned. All well, my Chelmer Gardens neighbours are concerned. That if, 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 if we're being labelled as being a safe, a, a safe borough, the police are taking our, our responses very casually. Thank you, Robert. Would you like to respond, councillors? I, I was not aware of that particular crime, and that is pretty scary. This comes up a lot, but the, the last thing I was going to mention was the, the to come to the police liaison group meetings. And they're now very well attended, I think, partly because I've been publicising them a lot. But the next one is Tuesday the 25th of June at the National Archives from 7.30 to 8.30. They're very well-run meetings. They're only an hour. The, the attendees select the, the three topics each time. And obviously, crime is the, the alarm about crime, crime in the area is the thing. And the, 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 our dedicated Q police officers are at these meetings. They are the best forum, and all the neighbourhood, all the neighbourhood watches, and all the community forums attend now. And there's, you know, it's a huge audience, and it's a really, really good place to a exchange reporting of crime if it has, if it has been missed. Um, really, that is a question that they cannot, the, the report, the, the arrival time of the police is a question that they have to answer. Um, I think we're all aware that Twickenham is now the nearest police station. The advice still is dial 999 in an emergency. I know that we all have a lot of problems with the reporting on the, the lesser number, is it 101, isn't it? Um, and I know that it is difficult and lengthy process and there's been a lot of complaints about that. My other advice locally is to follow MSPQ on Twitter if you have an iPhone, follow them on Twitter. They let you know when they're out in the community, they let you know where, where they are. You can then, you can actually message them and they also publicise where they're meeting. They do hold um, local meetings in coffee bars in addition to the police liaison group meetings which are bi-monthly. Um, and in response to to that, I will report that to uh, David Noakes, the borough um, community safety officer, um, because it is astonishing that we've not heard of that, so, especially so recently. Um, and but I will, and I will, I am going to the next PLG meeting, and I will certainly raise it there as well. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Campanale. Um, let's move to sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's so, it's so gloomy in the church, I can't actually <laughs> see people very clearly. Lady, Lady uh, two short questions, Lady. yes. Yes, one, you, you, you madam. Um, I'm sorry to say I've had the most terrible experience in Kew. I spent 30 years renovating a property on the Kew Gardens Road, and um, some people came in upstairs and downstairs. They smashed my doors in. They've blocked in my stained glass windows. They have uh, uprooted my trees. They've threatened me every weekend. Excuse me, I'm, I'm going to and stop you there because, sorry. because I've spoken to you privately about this matter many no, times. I haven't. Could, I haven't could spoken I, to you. Could I, I, I have not it? spoken to you no. at all. No. I no. wrote a letter to you okay. one year ago. I certainly please. haven't spoken to you. Could, could you the question put a is, question? I was arrested in Hankers by the police because my neighbours had smashed in my door and blocked in my windows. I was dragged down my drive in handcuffs that were too tight for me. I was thrown in a van. I was charged with harassment. This has gone on for four years. Nobody's helped me. Yeah, is somebody going to help me? We have met you, came to our surgery. I came to your surgery and I spoke to uh, this we, spoke we, were all, we were both there. Well, no, and to I've spoken to you personally, speak. and you've delivered letters to my house, uh, and we have spoken on this matter many times. What, Thank what you. What letter to your house? And Zach Wilkins is now going to help me. Uh, 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 Councillor Craigie, you spoke to this lady. Could you? Take that question. Well, I think the matter is um, quite sensitive and private, so I don't particularly want to give a thorough answer here. It's not here. private, it's absolutely disgraceful that 
police that became higher. I come from a family who built houses for 120 years. They dragged me down my drive in handcuffs, threw me in a van and tried to certify me. That is not private. It's, um, it's, uh, if you're willing to stick around to the end of the meeting, we can catch up on how your situation uh, has... Just taking it on board. Excellent. If, if I recall our last conversation, we did we did recommend. I met you once for half an hour. Thank you. I'm I'm, I'm going to terminate this. I'm going to terminate this discussion now. I'm afraid because otherwise we'll just get stuck on. Question from you, sir. Thank you. I was told today by a friend of a very ingenious scam which was perpetrated by people pretending to be the police. Uh, th these scams are getting more and more clever and sophisticated and I think it might be helpful and maybe there's some way of publicizing these to, to, to warn other people of, of how these operate. Uh, this particular lady was conned into believing that the people who rang her up were the police and she was then uh, persuaded to um, provide money for the, the perpetrators of the scam. Now these do get quite sophisticated and I think it might be helpful to, perpetrate, to, to tell people how these operate to, to warn people. Well, I think, Grant, I think the answer is absolutely and I think it needs to be, um, I think the PL, the police liaison group talk about it and I think uh, on social media it's uh, very uh, uh, talked about when people tell you never, ever, ever, uh, when somebody asks you for money over the phone, give them money over the phone. I mean, I, I get, I get uh, uh, calls all the time from uh, supposedly BT and there's something wrong with my computer. And uh, all, there are all different types of scans, but the issue is even when your bank pretends to ring you up, do not give them bank account details. And when they ask you to call the bank, when you are skeptical and they say, well, you can call this number, do not call the number because they leave the line open. Yes, it's means exactly they, what happened today. Exactly. So they leave the line open. And um, so I think we do need to publicise it and uh, we, will, we will talk to the local police to see how we can publicise it even more. Because I think you're right, we are a community that is vulnerable to those sort of scams. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to move to the next question now, um, which comes from Jane Spencer. Do we have Jane Spencer here? Uh, no, <laughs> so I'll read Jane Spencer's question. Uh, have you received the £50,000 promised as part of the Section 106 agreement in respect to the Brentford Football Club development from the London Borough of Hounslow? If so, when do you expect to begin the CPZ consultation process around the Kew Green and which roads will be included? And um, Councillor Burford, you're going to address that. So the answer is no. <laughs> we haven't received the money yet. Uh, we are uh, nearly every day um, asking officers, where is the money, where is the money, where is the money? It was promised to us in, I think, March and April, and uh, we're now in June. So we, we realise how important it is, and we realise how frustrating it is that we can't start this CPZ yet, uh, consultation yet. Um, so uh, the answer is, as soon as we get the money, we will start the consultation. The consultation is Q Green and all the roads off Q Green. So from uh, Gloucester to Priory to um, uh, Watcom Cottages, Cambridge Cottages, all of those roads will be uh, consult Forest Road, ha uh, Haverley, all of them will be, um, will be consulted. So the other issue for that little area while we're on it is that uh, the services have difficulty going through and down those roads as well. And uh, uh, as you know, the Forest Road has been consulted to have some double yellow lines on what I would classify the first little chicane as you go in from uh, Q Road. 
So that's just being consulted on because the services can't get down there. Uh, what can co uh, Cambridge Cottages, again, just purely on the corners, they can't get in. So they have put a consultation with just Cambridge Cottage for double yellow lines on the corners. And I think what will happen is all of those roads which interconnect around there, uh, so for instance, the corner of Mays and, and uh, Priory, um, all of those sort of corners, as part of the consultation or maybe before, officers will consult those roads to put the yellow lines or double yellow lines on those corners because we're very good at residence because where there's not a lot of parking space that we park wherever we can and we are parking on those corners which is illegal anyway but uh, it just means that the fire brigade and the services can't get down there so if it has a, if it's not consulted separately it will be part of that consultation thank you very much um, do we have any comment on that robert The issue, the issue of Brentford uh, Stadium isn't just about parking, it's about volume of traffic. Um, in, in fairly recent times, Kingston Bridge was widened. In the last century, Richmond Bridge was widened. Why can't Kew Bridge be widened? So Kew Bridge isn't under our um, jurisdiction, it's under TfL, and you may know that they are consulting on a cycle pathway. Uh, around that area. So to go over the bridge, which I think it was, well, they're, yeah, they're gonna make it more narrow and they, on the right-hand side, they're gonna put a cycle pathway on that right-hand side of the bridge. So again, if you have not seen that consultation, I can't remember when it closes, but we have publicized it and there is a whole consultation going around that, apart on that Brentford side, which as you know, is not in our domain and as Richmond Council, all we can really do is give our opinion as to what happens, and Hounslow and TfL do not need to take um, our opinion as consideration if they decide what they want to do. But just going on, the, the part of this consultation, and the CPZ consultation, is to do with the amount of traffic that may come over from Brentford and when the matches are on. And that's why the residents there are quite concerned that when they come home or you know when they leave there in the evenings, they may not have anywhere to park. So again, that's why the consultation is being uh, is being done, and that will impact also maybe in further areas uh, of the borough because the other uh, part of the borough that hasn't got any CPZ is towards uh, Thompson Avenue and um, all of that. So again, maybe in the future there'll be a consultation there. Thank you. Um, I, I read uh, this week, I think, that the stadium development is uh, on target and uh, that it should be ready for the opening of the 2020-2021 season, which is not that far away, so this is becoming an urgent matter. Um, let's move on to question three uh, from Suzanne Groom, who, is Suzanne Groom here? No, right, okay, well, Suzanne Groom has asked two questions. Um, the, first, the first question uh, from Suzanne Groom is, can the council put some pressure on the government to subsidize compostable plastic bags? Surely this makes sense, even now they are not widely available, and where they are, they are four to five times the price of non-recyclable plastic. Why are these even still on sale? Uh, and then a comment about many other green things the local council and government could do uh, if they were working hand in hand. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Campanani, please. Um, so I think um, I can't comment on what the government wants to do, but I can comment on what we hope to do locally. Um, so we've, um, I mean, environment is, is at the back of our minds with every decision that we've been making um, in this new administration. And we have, we have kicked off the Fair Trade Forum again. We are rewriting the air quality plan um, and that and the sustainability strategy and they are both being held in July. So they will both be passed in July. Um, and also the intention is by 2022 within the, bar, within the council itself that we will be plastic free. 
and then we then hope to influence the wider community. So we are starting from within, um, and by by a having the strategies in place and b leading by example. Um, and uh, locally, I know Q used to be a leading light in being uh, bag plastic bag free, um, and I think maybe we need to revisit that um, and and ensure that all the all the newer owner shops are maintaining that um, and but you know I can't answer the question on the government because this is about Q so thank you um, the second part of our uh, second question from Suzanne Grew uh, how can we campaign more effectively against aircraft noise and pollution uh, Councillor Craig uh, thank you Roger um, so I guess the question asks how can we more be more effective on this I think I actually struggle to give an answer and I think we're doing quite a thorough job at the moment. Um, everybody locally, uh, there's a vast majority of people are against it, I understand there is some support as well, but the vast majority are against it. The big efforts ongoing are the uh, joint judicial review with other councils uh, in the Heathrow area, um, joint because there's only a few legal matters to deal with and it splits the costs which are hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, that uh, application for judicial review was recently turned down but has been appealed. Um, on my insight, slight insider knowledge from uh, my wife who's a barrister is the chances of it ultimately being successful are slim, um, but it's about fighting the fight and making it very difficult and delaying things uh, until maybe central government changes its mind. Um, other things I might suggest are writing to the MPs, but all the local MPs certainly you know, are, are MPs adamantly against Heathrow, given his personal history, so that wouldn't help much, you wouldn't motivate him to work more. Um, and all the community groups are on it as well, Q Society, Hey Can, um, pretty much every lever that's being pressed, that can be pressed, is being pressed to push back locally on Heathrow and its uh, associated pollution. Uh, Councillor Cameron, I think it's interesting. Just when you say RMP, there's no MP. The MP for Richmond Park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Craigie. Um, could I just draw your attention to uh, the fact that uh, Heathrow Limited are about to issue uh, another document uh, on the sort of final plans for the expansion of Heathrow. Uh, that should be uh, in a few days' time. And uh, the Richmond Heathrow campaign uh, which has representation from the Q Society, the uh, Richmond Society and the Friends of Richmond Green are in the process of organising a public meeting mid-July, date to be confirmed, which will take place in the Duke Street Church. Uh, and on that occasion, the Richmond Heathrow campaign will be encouraging people to respond to the consultation. Uh, by uh, issuing some guidance at the meeting as to what your responses uh, might be. So that's a place where you might make uh, uh, an effort to go to to find out more about what's happening uh, locally in the opposition to Heathrow expansion. Um, question five. Um, this is a question from Andrew Fennels. See Angela in the audience. Uh, so, uh, Angela Fellows writes uh, Can you do more to help local traders, the lifeblood of the community? Uh, for example, reverse the Sandicum Road pavement extension, remove the additional double yellow lines, both of affected trade. In Q Village, parking could be revised to help traders, motorbike, moped parking provision. Uh, they use car spaces, Q Green Shops provide a short-term bay, uh, the news agent and general supply shop on Mortlake Terrace provide valuable service. One could purchase more heavy items rather than go further afield and uh, Councillor Campanale, I think you're going to take this one. Um, yes, I am. Um, several questions in there and um, quite a lot of descriptive answers that not sure that we can actually do. Um, I'll try and answer it. Um, the previous administration put in the crossing that isn't a crossing um, and there are no plans to revert it. Um, we can look at 
um, having a motorcycle bay put in, um, but we would have to demonstrate that there's clear demand and desire to have one. So there if there is, are any motorcycles... There is, because there's always the motorbikes that are always there every day. So that is something Shopping. officers have said they could, they're happy to look at that. Um, um, so we will, we will look at that then. Um, Q Green, the, the, the shops on Q Green, as Councillor Burford has explained, there's going to be a review. Well, we're, we're waiting, as you know. We, hope, we hoped we'd have the money and the consultation by March, and we're now in June. We're still waiting, um, but we are pushing. I mean, we are sending nearly weekly emails going, come on, where's the money? What, what's going on? Um, so it is coming, and the, so the Q Green shops will be, the consultation will include that whole area. Um, and actually, I disagree with what the lady says. Um, there is evidence that when, when you go 20 miles an hour, people, um, there's actually an increase in spending in local shops. When people are walking and cycling to school and stuff, the evidence is that they actually spend more in the local shops. So that's encouraging, and, and I hope that does prove to be the case. Um, I've put here, we can't dictate what a, stock, what a shop stocks. Um, I think she was asking for specific items to be stocked in a shop. Um, I think that answers, I think that answers everything. Um, can, so, I, can I just... Know, absolutely. Yeah, can I just add, on the, on the Morlake Road, those shops are really good. Unfortunately, that road is TFL. Yeah. And again, right, we have no jurisdiction on those red roofs whatsoever. So. Though there's a great little coffee shop, that, that new little pastry coffee shop is absolutely brilliant and they do great little um, spinach pastries, which are lovely. <laughs> but, and, then, and, then, yeah. and then you've got the, the new um, uh, utility, not utility shop, but a community store there, which again is a great, it's a great asset, absolutely great asset. So the only thing we can do, maybe again within that consultation, is look at where we can put parking but it will never be on that on that Morlake Road because it's just too busy away and it's TFL. So we would have to look in Cambridge Gardens, but if anybody knows Cambridge Gardens already, that is around uh, and uh, it's very difficult to get in there. So the only place where there are um, loading bays is by the coach and horses. There are two spaces, three spaces, two spaces there. So you might be able to do a one hour no a wait and return there, but I mean that would be the closest or the other side by by the botanist where they you might be able to put something in there. Can I just add and um, talking about that the coach and horses, I, the community police actually asked me to mention that they couldn't get through there the other day. So they are reporting that to um, we're gonna have a fire engine audit because they couldn't actually the, the police van couldn't get through just doing their rounds. Um, and so they were, they were concerned, so they have actually referred it to the fire brigade to do a review. So that will, with the evidence of that, will also be included when we do that whole review of that, that patch. There's quite a lot of things in that area, and we are aware that it's it's a long time coming. So you know, bear with us because we are we are trying. Any other comments from those present? In that case, we'll move to the last of the submitted questions. Uh, which was also from Angela Fennels. Can you reverse the bonfire ban on allotments? Far more pollution produced by driving to the recycling unit, which is already at peak use. And uh, Councillor Craig, I think you're going to take that one, please. Then you then your comment, Councillor Campanale. Oh, you're starting. Yeah. Right. Fine. <laughs> um, so, uh, no. Basically, no. I, I chaired the scrutiny committee, which uh, unanimously cross-party took the decision to ban bonfires on council-owned allotments. That decision was then backed up by full council, um, by committee, and then at full council. We are not going to be reversing that decision. The decision was made on the grounds of air quality. The decision will not be reversed, no matter how much bullying on social media I have to endure, um, personally, which has been totally unwarranted, unnecessary, and um, regrettable. Um, I chaired a committee, cross-party, it was a unanimous decision. We discussed the, the topic robustly. Um, Councillor Craigie also sat on that committee, so he can back me up with this. And I at no point told anybody that they should drive their waste to the dump. 
okay? At no point did I say. What I will say is that um, work continues with officers and the representatives from the um, groups, from BRAG, which are, have elected representatives. They are still meeting with officers um, and they are still considering the numerous options to dispose of waste. And I will finish by saying that my own parents are disabled and live in this borough and they pay for their garden waste bin. And that's where they put their garden waste. And if they can't fit it in the bin, I go round and I chop it up and I put it in special bags and they pay for a special waste collection. Um, I think I'd better stop there because I'm quite <laughs> angry. <laughs> Thank, thank, thank you. <laughs> this is a, um, a follow-up comment. I think uh, there has been quite a lot of feedback on the decision to uh, ban bonfires. I think actually we're perhaps a little bit ahead of the curve here because if we, when we did it, um, it's only a matter of time until Sadiq Khan uh, does that London-wide as well. So um, even if we were to reverse the decision at some point in the next couple of years, um, connected with all the other air quality steps he's taking, uh, he'll enforce a London-wide ban on, on, on fires on public land. Um, so I appreciate it has caused inconvenience for some people. Hopefully, though, the ban came in at about the right time of year in that you know spring and stuff. There isn't too much to burn. And anticipate that through consultation and the office that by the autumn when there are there is material to dispose of, there will be provisions put in place uh, and facilities provided of some kind, or at least plans in place to um, uh, enable people to avoid driving to the dump. Uh, and uh, I would just say on the driving to the dump issue, um, it's not a good uh, way of uh, burning fuel. However, even if it does require some fuel um, to drive to the dump, if that's the last resort disposal route, um, the quality of the fumes coming out of a bonfire, and there's probably some experts in the room can back me up on this, are truly awful, and you know that from having had a bonfire, and how sticky the smoke is, how it sticks to your clothes. It does that to lungs, um, it does that in all the area around neighbouring uh, gardens and stuff. So it is quite a difference in quality of, of pollution. Bonfires are really nasty, even though they're infrequent. They are worth banning, they are quite carcinogenic and unpleasant. Thank you. Um, could I just, uh, 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 there's a question at the back. Yes. Um, might, they, might they not consider composting? It would be useful on their own allotments, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. it's, indeed, it's, yeah, so um, we, have, we are exploring uh, more organised composting methods. I think to be fair to allotment holders, I'm, I'm a fairly um, experienced horticulturist myself as well. There are times when you need to dispose of woody material or, or disease material when composting is inappropriate, um, but more composting will reduce the volume of, of material that needs to be uh, disposed of off-site. Um, yeah, definitely. But I think the allotment holders are probably on that already. Mostly. Grant? Grant, you go first, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is it permitted to have a bonfire in one's own garden? Because I did this um, many years ago in a previous house, and I was amazed actually how smelly it was. And how, but I was told at the time that it was actually perfectly legal. Uh, if it is legal, is it possible for the council to ban them? Because I think there's only a few people who will have allotments to put and want to burn rubbish, and lots of people will have gardens and want to do it. And, and surely, if there are uh, bonfires in private gardens, that's causing a frightful pollution problem. Councillor Campanelli. Yes, it is currently legal to have bonfires and go in your own private garden at certain times. However, watch this space. Uh, uh, Robert. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Craigie mentioned driving to the dump. It's very difficult to go to the dump other than by car. Shouldn't there be a facility to, to be able to cycle or walk to the dump? There is. Hmm. Well, <laughs> it does. It has a sign saying "cars this way." There's no. There's no. Uh, obviously safe or easy way to actually cycle or walk into them. No, I fully support your comments. The uh, long-running issues of accessibility, traffic at that dump site, it is far from ideal. 
we do totally agree with you. The uh, vehicle access only, and it, is, it does feel quite unsafe to try and walk in there, and then you're right, I think there are signs saying kind of don't, um, is a problem. Um, if you could find us maybe another sort of 100 metres around the outside of that site, knock down some of those flats, we'd do all the things we wanted to do. Um, but some of the other residents might be very cross about that. Uh, it, it, we're just really physically stuck with that site. It's, uh, that site isn't, that recycling site, that, that dump site is not going to move in the near term or even possibly in the long term. We have you know, schools on either side on the entrance road that make it very difficult to access. It's a very small site given the level of use it's now getting. The one positive thing I think we can say is we are actively pursuing the ability to use, uh, officially use dumps outside the borough and come to collaboration with uh, folks outside the borough. We have run into some logistical challenges that are the way our dumps are run, they are effectively outsourced to the contra uh, contractors. Contractors uh, that we use don't are the contractors for the neighbouring boroughs. So, and we have to, and we can't even get the promised 50,000 out of Hounslow, for example. So it's a logistical and practical challenge to find alternatives, uh, but fully respect your point. Uh, as soon as we have a solution, we will try and implement it. Can I just, uh, thank you, uh, Ian, can I just wrap up this discussion with an interesting tidbit of information that you might like that I got from uh, King's College London this week, where they uh, monitor the London pollution uh, officially on behalf of uh, uh, GLA and so on. Uh, and uh, they said that the worst particulate uh, <coughs> pollution in East and South London uh, this year so far was on Easter Monday, which followed the day on which uh, people traditionally light bonfires in uh, Holland and North Germany to celebrate uh, Easter. And there just happened to be an easterly wind that day. So we, as a result of that, got the worst pollution uh, in London for particulates uh, this year, which I, I think shows how dangerous bonfires are. Now I have, um, sorry? <laughs> It was a joke. Is that a Brexit observation? <laughs> That's not a Brexit observation. It comes from an academic unit at King's College London. Um, we have one more question, uh, which uh, is from Roger Metcalf, and I see he is actually here to ask his own question. So, Roger, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. I thought you'd forgotten all about me. No, no, it's an interesting. My piece of paper didn't have your question on, but fortunately, I had a view of uh, Councillor Burford's piece of paper. And 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 uh, thank you, Councillors, for a very uh, uh, stimulating evening and event. Um, my question is: What are the Council's plans to preserve weekly collections for all categories of waste and recycling? And what plans does the Council have to improve provision of recycling for those residents? like myself, who live in flats. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Roger. Um, we have uh, no plans to do anything other than weekly correction. Um, having uh, never, we've looked at this in detail to see whether any money would, could be saved, and the answer, according to the data we've seen, actually looking at things in the round, given the extra costs of um, cleaning up things if there's two weekly collections, dealing with fox damage and stuff like that, there's actually no case at all, it's my understanding, for moving to bi-weekly collections. Even a financial one, that on the face of it, would actually look like it would be cost-saving. If we want to maintain the, the ward and the boa in a, the, the nice state it generally is, uh, two weekly collections will create lots of headaches that need money spending on to tidy up. So no plans at all uh, and no motivation to move away from weekly collections. Um, in terms of your second part of your question, the recycling provision, an excellent question. Um, there has been uh, an ongoing trial, uh, particularly focused on food waste, uh, since October last year. Um, this was a, uh, a 500 uh, flat trial, um, which, and the feedback coming in from that now is that it has been quite successful. Um, so eight tonnes of food waste uh, have been recycled, which otherwise would have been um, incinerated. There's a plan to increase that trial to uh, 1,000 flats uh, by the end of the year, um, and plans, longer, longer term plans to roll that out to more and more flats uh, as and when it is possible. 
um, and ongoing, there's ongoing uh, plans and renegotiation of uh, waste contracts and things like that to look at making non-food recycling available to more uh, flat dwellers ongoing. It is a priority for us um, uh, and things move as fast as they do, which is often not quite as fast as we would like. Thank you very much, Councillor Craigie. Um, any comments on that last response? In that case, uh, we'll move to the open session for questions. Um, I can see a hand up already. Uh, we've had a good discussion already on a number of issues, uh, including pollution, crime, Heathrow, parking around Kew Green, and so on. But uh, I know all of us are aware of other problems uh, in the ward, uh, such as poor pavements, uh, collisions with the District Line Bridge on Mortlake Road, uh, step-free access or lack of it at the uh, station, um, and so on. You, you know all these things. So I'm sure that uh, there will be more questions generated. Um, let's try and take questions from areas that we haven't discussed so far before anybody returns to another area. So, uh, Cheryl Gifts over here, I saw your hand up. Over here, please. Uh, I just would like to know what is the current situation with the Q Retail Park? Uh, there's a lot of rumors, uh, there's some apparently uh, uh, truth to the story that the property has actually been sold for redevelopment and my concern is the great overdevelopment that's currently kind of pushing on in queue. So who knows what about what's happening to that piece of property. Please. Well I think there are lots of rumours and there is nothing concrete yet that is happening to that block uh, in terms of redevelopment. So um, at this moment in time until such time as a developer comes forward with a plan at the moment it's still the retail park and the way the retail park is uh, jd sports have just gone in that um mns own most uh, uh, own some of that plot as well so um, and they're still there so the answer is i have nothing new apart from uh, a scurrilous scaremongering and uh, rumor uh, as to what's happening on that plot but at the moment there is a, there is a view because of the other plots that are being developed like in home base and everything else that sooner or later that seems to be a prime site for redevelopment but it isn't up yet thank you <laughs> caroline Brock. Um, mine's more of a kind of strategic question so expect an immediate answer and, and something that might engage the community. I'm just wondering what in queue we might do to uh, help with climate change and the greening agenda and it could, things occur to me and I don't have budget consequences so it would be a non-starter but could we do something about green walls? You know, I can think of at least one place which is at the end of my range so I would, wouldn't I? Uh, Elizabeth Cottages has got a, a big wall that could be made green and I'm sure there are other places. I've also always thought why is it that um, Again, particularly on Sandica Road where there's space. Um, I know that the pavement immediately in front of shops belongs to the shops and virtually all of them pave them over. And wouldn't it be lovely if they would um, maybe get Zeta Elsa to design for them nice green front spaces instead of having it obsolete and not very attractive. So I think there are lots of small ideas around the community which maybe people could be asked to submit ideas about how can we do our little bit in queue, above all in queue for heaven's sake, uh, we ought to be leading the way in uh, trying to get a greener borough. Thank you Caroline. Um, Ian, you, you led on discussions of the atmosphere with bonfires, do you have any comments? Um, a great question and great suggestions. Um, I think the, uh, it becomes relevant particularly towards the end of the meeting when we're going to talk about uh, new ward-based uh, sort of budgets available. There might be, some of those ideas might be a really prime uh, target for that uh, new way of allocating funding to local communities. Um, 
and, and other than that, uh, the issue will be budget, as you've identified. Um, uh, but yeah, I think certainly design is uh, uh, probably going to be affordable, um, particularly um, about implementation, particularly of payments, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, but something to be fund fundraised for, and something to look longer term uh, into where that money could come from. Because once you've got a firm plan uh, and a good goal, everything gets much easier. So no, great ideas. Um, I'm not sure if the other thing to add. Do you want to add something? Yeah. Um, uh, firstly, C. Uh, Trailsy was actually concreting over her front garden this evening. Um, <laughs> however, I do hope that she will then make it beautiful after she's been concreted it <laughs> and, and do what we all should do if we have any concrete in our front garden, which is green it as much as possible with, with contrasting planting. Um, so, um, but I take your point. Um, green walls, yes, all three state primary schools in our ward are on TFL red routes, either straight on or nearby. Um, and I know Queen's have already started fundraising for, they have a very long uh, stretch of wall. So I know the schools are desperately fundraising for green walls, and I think that's a good place to start. And maybe we could, maybe we should get together as a community and start with the schools. Um, but I agree with you. Um, I've seen in, in central London they've been trialling these sort of temporary green walls, which I think again could be um, worth exploring. Um, I mean, we are of course acute, acutely aware and lucky that we've got the Botanic Gardens, which does provide us somewhat a green lung. But I, I, I'm very keen on improving the, the visual environment and the healthy environment locally and, and, and we are all on that. I know that uh, Councillor Burford's been doing some work with Kew Riverside on trying to reclaim a tiny piece of land um, between the school and the, the dump um, just to greenify that. I don't know if, how that's where you got to. You know? um, oh, sorry if I dump it. <laughs> um, uh, I think one would call it, I think they call it guerrilla gardening. <laughs> And so, uh, we, uh, as you know, uh, we beautified the um, uh, High Park Avenue on the corner of High Park Avenue and, and North Road, which I believe the AQ Society helped out on that, which is absolutely lovely. And then there was that other bit of guerrilla gardening to stop a, a, a mast coming up, which apparently needs a bit of cutting back, apparently. So I have put forward the Q Society as the people to cut that back because I couldn't think of anybody else. <laughs> and then on the Moorbake Road, there's a little triangle there again, which was all a bit of shrub uh, raised bed, which we got the local community to, to plant um, some plants in there and, and they look after that. So the only issue about the one metre from a shop is it belongs to the shop. So we have to persuade the shop uh, uh, to put some greenery. Now, I was trying to persuade uh, Featherstone Lee the other day uh, to put a bit of greenery on there because they have rather about two and a half metres coming out on that, on, the, on that area, which is rather slippery tiles, and people keep falling on the, on the slippery tiles. Though they would say it's trespass because they're not allowed there and it's stuff, but anyway. So I was trying to persuade them to actually put some potted plants there, so to make it all beautiful and all the rest of it. And they did look at that and they thought about it. And then they thought by the time they put the pots there and the plants and all the rest of it, by the following day, all the pots and the plants would be gone. So, yeah. So I think it is a great idea. There is also, uh, was it Richmond in Bloom? Richmond in Bloom? which used to beautify um, uh, different wards. And they, I remember years ago, we used to have beautiful hanging baskets off, uh, off our street lights. Didn't and I, find any volunteers to do it. Didn't find it. Well, maybe, again, through this, we need to maybe just try and find volunteers. I know um, it's difficult. No? OK. Well, just, sorry, I was just going to say, I think that used to be the case in Richmond, but I think they do now sponsor a certain number of heavy baskets that they can kill some deep water so that they are some. But I was just thinking that <laughs> I was just thinking that wouldn't it be nice to ask the community? There are a lot I'm sure there are lots of ideas in the community about little spaces that could be greened up. And if at least we had a sort of audit of uh, you know, where would that be? And then there are initiatives like with Swellen to do uh, crowd, um, what's it called, crowd, crowd funding, 
that you know we, we could do something um, and involve all the community, not just the Q Society, though I have to say that in recent years they've done a lot on gardening. <laughs> um, but we could wipe that out without too much difficulty and too much cost. Councillor Campanale, you have another point. I just wanted to add that we've, uh, we've also had a lot of um, uh, people newer to the area get, have got in touch with me asking how to get involved with things. So there's a good gym and Plogolution, these, these groups that go running and they do a specific clean up job um, whilst they're running. Um, and I think there is, and, and I'm also on the um, uh, Thames Landscape Strategy for Q to Chelsea. Um, and I hear about all these different things, but I think you're right, we need to pull it all together somehow and do an audit and, and then work out which group would be the best to do the, the task. Um, I'm also trustee for Spear and I notice they have listened to me and they have tidied up one of their properties that I noticed they're gardening this week. In fact. So I do try and prompt. But I think we should do an audit. Lady Two Rose Bank. Um, this is a different topic. That's all right. Um, I wanted to ask if there's any progress about disabled access to the station because it's such a dreadful problem. Yeah. Um, and the number of times that you know, people can't get their push chairs and you can't tell someone with three children they've got to walk all the way around. Thank you, Teresa. Um, okay, I'll try and do this in the shortened version. Good. Um, <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, a, a year ago we had a meeting, us, us three councillors had a meeting with um, a, an engineer from the council and the heritage officer from the council. And we looked at the possibility, I thought, oh, you could just put the lifts in, use the tunnel that's there, surely. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. So we can't use the tunnel and we can't use the 30s bridge, so neither of the existing bridges can be used for heritage or logistical engineering reasons. So the only way that we are going to get a um, transport across the station is a complete new built bridge. We have identified two potential sites within the station platform. Um, might mean rearranging some of the planting. <laughs> um, so we have identified two potential sites um, and then the brick wall that we've hit is that this is going to cost three million. <gasps> minimum. The minimum. Minimum. The other brick wall that we've hit is that TFL, Regard, and, and all the train companies regard Kew Garden Station as accessible. It is regarded as accessible because you can access the platform on the level on either side. That is regarded as accessible. And because you only have to travel one stop to Richmond to change the platforms, that is regarded as accessible. We then went further, no they don't, um, we then went further and we applied for the grant, there's a round of grants every four years, we applied for the grant, I discovered all sorts of weird and wonderful facts like we are one of the top fifth most used stations in the UK. We put in all this, we put in that the National Archives is a national should be accessible, that the Botanic Gardens is World Heritage Shark site. We, tried, we threw everything at it and we got none, none of the grant for any of the stations in this borough. So it's not just us that were turned down. So I then, we then have got to the point now that we are, we, if we're going to pursue this, we are looking at fundraising in minimum three million. We last week got together, Q Society have also looked at um, the station with the station engineers and come to the same conclusions and got quotes for things that, that the same answers effectively. We then, all of us, us three councillors uh, and um, Roger and the Royal Botanic Gardens with several members of their staff had a meeting last week to get together to discuss the issue with them. And we all agree, we're all on the same page, um, but none of us have got three million. So my, I was thinking about this last night because I was, thought this might come up. And so my next plan was that we hold um, an open forum meeting to discuss with residents whether they want to continue with, with the idea of fundraising privately or whether we look at um, a shuttle bus from Rich Richmond Station or alternative ideas. So, but I think that's a whole other meeting, to be honest. Could I just add that um, the, uh, the Q Society uh, has submitted an application to the Community Fund 
uh, for not for three million pounds, but for a relatively small sum of money to uh, fund a feasibility study by an independent uh, civil engineer to see what an independent engineer thinks is feasible as opposed to what TfL say is feasible. Um, and of course we're waiting the uh, results of that application. Theresa? Has it, has it been put to the, to the trade on Stay on the train if you need, because they don't tell people that. I tell people, and if they're coming to Kew Gardens once, they're not going to come again. But I say to them, next time, stay on the train and wait for it to come back. That, that, I think that point has been made, Teresa, but nothing has happened. But it's, it, it, it's something that I think we should keep uh, hammering away at. Um, <laughs> I think they probably don't want to do it. Uh, because it doesn't look good if you say stay on the train for another station, go to Richmond, cross on the platform to the district line, coming back the way you came and get off a queue. Um, it's an admission of uh, defeat on their part, isn't it? Whilst maintaining that they have to have free access. Robert, uh, and, oh wait a minute, there's a couple at the back, yes. It's, it's see, two people waving their hands at the back. Uh, are you going to comment on this topic? No, I want to go back to I question to number one. Right. Uh, we just had a drink. Let, let's have Robert first in that case if it's on this topic. We'll, we'll come to you, madam, at the back uh, if we're going to go back again. Yes. Is there an option for a step free tunnel? No. no. Not currently. Not yeah. according to TfL and Network Rail. The, there isn't enough run-up. The, en the engineer that we took out said there's not enough, you haven't got enough angle to even do that, because I did think about graded steps and, and kind of using what we've already got um, as far as we can. But no, there isn't enough run-up. Um, so, no, that's uh, a bit uh, And we can't, we're not allowed to touch, because they're all heritage. We can't touch any of the structures anyway. No, so it's a great to list in buildings, so we can't touch them. Yeah. And it's too near, even the actual station building is heritage, so you can't do anything too near to the pretty ticket office. It's it's really restrictive. So also the bridges are, are listed. Yeah. So we, we were looking at, at citing it close to the bridge, and the National Heritage said you can't because you're too close to the bridge and you're ruining the view of the bridge. If you put, if you put something like no, absolutely they are, but they are uh, they are a listed build, listed bridge. Both of those bridges are listed bridges. I think the short answer to the question is everybody is trying very hard on this and will continue to do so and uh, that we're all working together on it. And we're all on the same page, I mean, we, we, nobody yeah. disagrees. <laughs> um, lady in the front here, is this on this topic as well? No. 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 Right. I'm going to go to the lady at the back who's been waiting for several minutes now. Thank you. This is finished. Uh, that's all right. Um, is that right. Caroline at the back then? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's only us. Uh, right at the beginning, the very first uh, question that you raised was about the 20 mile an hour limit, and which I agree with absolutely. I think I've got no problem. However, I've seen anywhere else where it's been installed, the most uh, uh, everywhere, 20 mile an hour signs littering every single street. Now, 30 mile an hour, we don't need signage because we know what is going to happen when we introduce 20 miles an hour and are our streets going to be cluttered with signs at every corner because I think it will ruin the whole um, area. Yeah, yeah um, so uh, no, good question. Uh, street furniture is definitely something that was considered quite heavily during the whole consultation uh, period which is one of the reasons the uh, big drivers to do it bow wide. So the need for a sign occurs whenever there's a transition from one speed limit to another. And the reason for doing the whole ward and the whole bower as a unit is it vastly reduces the amount of, of signage required, reducing both the cost and, and the obstructions on the pavement. 
So in Q, we're, we're unfortunately, because we've got two TFL roads on either side of the borough, actually on all three sides, frankly, of the borough, that is a challenge because each of those is either 30 or 40 and then coming down to uh, 20. Am I actually Q road? Remind me, Q road. Q road. Q road staying at 20, which is one of the main reasons for it, actually, so there doesn't have to be a sign on every corner onto Q road. Um, Morelay Road obviously will have to stay at 30 because it's TFL. Um, so on every transition there will be a new sign facing both ways. Um, so there will be some extra furniture. There will be nothing else though, so there aren't going to be any nasty speed humps or traffic calming and things like that. Um, briefly, um, none of us are in favour of unnecessary street furniture or street signage. Um, and. As we said, one of the reasons we, we wanted the, it, the 20 miles an hour to be borough wide is simply to reduce the signage. Um, you will, however, notice signs going up in queue in uh, the summer, I believe, because it will, 20 MPH is going to be implemented in September, starting in queue and bonds. So our signs will go up first. Right, I've got, I can see three questions of the lady with a green top there. Did you want to ask a question, Madam? No. Could you take the microphone, please? You're saying, well, you can always stay on the train and get to Richmond and back to Kew. We're assuming that people are coming to Kew Gardens from like, central London. What about people coming? It doesn't work if you're coming out from outside and you've got to Richmond and you've then got on the train to Kew Gardens and you're suggesting that they sit all the way to Upminster and back so they yeah. can get off again. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so that suggestion only works for people coming from central London. It's not solving the yeah. problem for... Yeah. Everyone else. Uh, they they can change the gas bridge if they're going the other way. Yeah. That oh, that's possibility. Th thank you yeah. uh, for that comment. Um, th there's a lady over there at the back, and then a lady here at the front. So, this lady, please. Yes, I see. Go oh, wait for the microphone, please. Um, I don't live in you. I do have a business here. It's called the Roma Organic. The only councillor I have ever met has been Councillor Burford when I first started six years ago. So it's jolly nice to see you all here today. I was wondering why um, at Christmas time we cannot get funded for lights in Sankham Road. It is all concentrated around the horseshoe and nothing happens along Sandicum Road. And most of the businesses there really need Christmas lighting as well. And I, I, I mentioned this five years ago when I first started, and nothing has happened so far. I physically went around to all the businesses in Sandicum Road myself to see if they would be prepared to fund some lighting. And unfortunately, it was met with sort of well, you know, it's not up to us, it's up to the council. They might, they might not. I'm wondering if we could sort of approach um, Con O'Brien in Richmond to actually get some money for us this year. Well, the answer is, uh, thank you for the question, the answer is I think absolutely that those shops should have lights uh, uh, along that Sandicum Road and along the parade. Unfortunately, it is up to the traders to apply for things like Civic Pride to get lights, right, to get money for lights. Even in the village, it's not the council that put those lights up, it's the traders who put the lights up and organize the, the beautification, the Christmas beautification uh, uh, for those Christmas lights. So the council give them some money for lights because they apply to civic pride. So maybe we need to talk and arrange a meeting with all of those uh, traders along there to actually try and um, get them to uh, be more enthusiastic over Christmas. Well, the other thing is, of course, the hanging baskets as well. They would, they would uh, really look lovely as the summer if we had to keep hanging baskets in San Camaro. You know what? I mean, the thing is, it is all seems to be concentrated around the horseshoe. And those businesses have all been there for a very long time, and they don't need the effort. We need something to say to people that are coming to Kew Gardens, um, this way are the shops. 
some sort of notice pointing in the direction of Sandicum Road that there are more shops and restaurants along there. Well, we are looking at, um, Kew Gardens at the moment is looking at uh, new signage. And once they have um, worked on that and, and designed their new signage, we are hoping to piggyback on the look of that signage and change the wayfa wayfaring in, in the village, which could, should include telling people about the shops down Sandicum Road. And in addition to the signage, um, the Fair Trade Forum are hoping to do a map or a guide for fair trade goods, um, which could possibly help with your business. Um, and there is a new restaurant opening at the, the lock a bit further down Sandicum. But we are aware that uh, the horseshoe is kind of, but even, even the, some of the uh, businesses in the horseshoe, people don't find it because it's not obvious. So I think we do need to have some sort of map or sign for the whole of the village. And if we do it, we will make sure it includes everybody, not just the horseshoe. There's a lady at the front here who had a question. But we do need to get the traders together to work together as one to to beautify that section of, of Sandkin Road. Thank you. Yes, lady. Hello. Um, yes, I guess my concern is uh, Hammersmith Bridge being closed and coming back to traffic, which is undoubtedly worse in queue with Hammersmith Bridge out. Um, and I noticed that in Sheen they've been proactive and putting more no entry signs so you can't get from um, uh, Richmond Park down onto the South Circular. They put in like three no entry signs, which seems very wise. Um, so I'm wondering what, what we're doing. As I hear the bridge is going to be out for three years, is how do we get, how do we ensure that Q doesn't suffer more? And I'm wondering what the strategy is also around cycling and whether there's any opportunity to extend TFL cycles so that people can, can park them and bring come to queue more on bikes than they do uh, by car. So, uh, Councillor Campanale on the bridge, JF on bikes. Right, well, freestyle. <laughs> Briefly on the bridge, um, Councillor Eamon, who is Transport and Deputy Leader, is having a meeting uh, next week. He's, he's had several meetings as Council Leader with, <coughs> with Hammersmith. Um, Councillor Eamon has written, I've seen social media, uh, saying that he's requested for um, transport, some sort of transportation, sort of milk cart style, um, over the bridge for disabled and less mobile on the actual bridge itself. So he is in liaison, he is having um, a meeting, I think it's sold out, I think it was a pre-booked one. Um, we are on it, we're doing what we can. I hear what you're saying about the um, access, you know, avoiding people coming through queue, and that is something that I will raise, or we will raise with Council Emin as to, we, we look at what they're doing in, in Sheen and see if we can replicate that, because it is obviously, um, you know, I live on one of the main roads in queue too, I've noticed the, the increase in traffic as well. Bikes. Uh, just going back to the, the one-way systems in Ishin, they were being trialled before the actual bridge and they were there not because of the bridge, oh. but because of residents' concerns with, with traffic, so they were being trialled. And loads of residents in Ishin are up in arms about the, the trial of the, the little one-way system, so I'm not sure it would be very good uh, to trial that here. Though some people do want one-way systems on all different types of roads in queue. Um, <laughs> Bikes, bicycles. So we did trial um, uh, bikes. Uh, there were the orange bikes, which we trialed, which uh, didn't go very well, and they've been taken away. We are try now trying uh, electric bikes, the Lime bikes, uh, which are, are being brought in. Uh, we had asked originally at one stage for, uh, I think they're called Boris or Sadiq bikes, depending on which bikes they are, uh, but they felt that Richmond was too far to introduce those bikes. So we weren't allowed those bikes, and that's why we're trialing other forms of bikes to actually make us uh, get onto bicycles. We're also looking at, in terms of cycle lanes, improving within our roads uh, cycle lanes and having a, a uh, and having a proper uh, um, uh, uh, 
cycle pathways which are linked throughout the whole borough. And can I just add, I've also applied for the cycle racks at the new little um, refurbished playground next to the Montessori on Sandicum, or Victoria Cottages. Um, where a tree had to be taken down, it's not a, we can't replace a tree there, unfortunately. So I've applied for cycle racks to go there to encourage the um, nursery school parents to have cycles. Stephen Speak has a question, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, JF just mentioned cycle lanes and they're like it's um, opportune therefore just to ask um, what the situation is with Q Road and um, the cycle lane versus parking dilemma that goes on there. I, I've seen recently that the cycle lobby is um, sort of claiming success there and that uh, the parking will be removed. Now, I mean, I think that would be a major concern to take the parking away without some sort of alternative arrangements and so I'd be interested to know what sort of alternative arrangements are going to be in place and where you stand on it. Um, so I can't tell you uh, yet what the uh, arrangements are. This is being looked at by officers in consultation with Kew Gardens. So we're all working together with the Kew Society, Kew Gardens and council officers are working on a plan for that area which will come in as part of the 20 MPH. Um, so therefore I, I can't give you any more news apart from the fact that officers are looking at it, they're looking at different uh, plans and different ways of, uh, of um, looking at the cycle lane and parking and uh, uh, coaches and all of that sort of stuff. So, so nothing actually planned at the moment? Nothing actually planned at the moment because I, I, all I know is that they are looking at uh, what is the best thing to do there because we have loads of issues with uh, Litchfield and Kew Gardens on those junctions and it's just looking at the whole road holistically with the parking, with the cycle lane that's never used and all of that sort of stuff. Um, the other two pence I'd throw in is that if you take away the parking, the speeds on the road will increase. No, because it's a 20 mile an hour. Regardless of the size. It's a 20 mile an hour car area. And that's why they're looking at it. Because it's got loads of kids going backwards and forwards. There's been loads of um, accidents on that road. And there was a fatality there last year uh, with the motorbike and things like that. So that's why it's all being looked at. Gentlemen on the other side of the aisle, please, next to you. This is on a new topic, I hope that's all right. Um, yes. Is it possible to persuade the dustmen to do their jobs a bit less negligently? I came out of my um, house on Monday morning and there were four items from my uh, recycling distributed about it. One tin, um, two trays and a bottle. Um, and as I walked up Pensford Avenue, there were paper all over the place and other uh, plastic trays and things um, left about. Uh, I have in the past photographed these and sent them off to the council, but without any noticeable result. Uh, it's, I can understand that they dropped them fine, but can they pick them up again? Yeah. Um, thank you for that comment. Um, there is indeed uh, occasional instance where the uh, contractors haven't done as good a job as we would like. The best thing to do is to call council customer services. Um, you'll hopefully get a very warm reception uh, that will call the incident. They will pass it on to the contractor. If the issue is serious enough, the contractor will come back and fix it. Um, at the very least, they will log it as a problem. And if everyone reports all the little instances, they basically track down the staff and have a word, which is kind of what you want. Um, and I have had personally good success uh, with that when bins weren't working properly. Call our customer services, tell them where the problem is. Um, and certainly if it's a consistent problem, it should go away after a few weeks if there's, if there's a team or staff member not performing adequately. Um, that is the best solution in the short term. If it becomes a long term persistent problem, please do bring it to our attention again and we'll escalate it for you because uh, it is a really important matter. Thank you. Another, uh, another gentleman on the aisle here. New topic, it's the um, turning off your engines, no idling. Um, by North Sheen Station at the, uh, you know, the crossing there. It's a terrible problem. Nobody turns off their engine except me. Um, <laughs> what, what sort of arrangements do we think might be in place to enforce this? Okay. Um, 
the arrangements are already in force. The um, traffic wardens can now fine, I think it's £40 for idling. Um, they now have anti-idling. Um, but will they be there? Yes, I was just about to follow on with. Yeah, that I, I understand the problem is that the office, the traffic wardens have to be at the sites to do it. Um, and of course, the problem is that they go and tell someone to turn their engine off, and then they do turn their engine off, so they can't then find them. So, you know, they, they they're not making any money out of it, if you like. But the good news is that again, because um, 20 mph is coming here first. That means the traffic wardens will come here first as well, because because when 20 mph is rolled out, the traffic wardens will follow the rollout. So we will we will then be able to see whether it measurably see because they can as well as 20 and 20 mph they can also find for the idling. Um, and we have we it's not just by the station we have we have hot spots. We've got a lot of problems with um, uh, taxi and Uber pickups around the Kew Gardens as well and, and so you know we will we know where the patches are we know where the problems are and you can also write to us and we can um have anti-idling signs put up i know i don't i'm not a big fan of over signage but if it's a particular problem i, I know one couple where i've had a sign put up because the, the coaches were persistently idling outside their bedroom claiming that they were switching their engines off but clearly not um, please write to us if it's a persistent problem in a particular patch and we, we, there are two things we can do. One is we can put signs up and the other is we can actually send the traffic wardens out to that patch. And we'll have to see how, see how it goes. I mean, we are the first area. So. Which would like to the population don't know that this ban now exists? Or that there's a fine? Yes. True. True. <laughs> I will mention it and we'll... I, I think time is moving on, so and speak, you have a question. Um, last year you say that there's going to be the rolling out queue first for the 20 miles an hour, but yeah. Manor Road and the North Sheen is obviously North Richmond, which is a different board. Yeah. Do you know how that's going to roll out and the implications of when they'll really start hanging around at Manor Road or the North Sheen? I, I don't know, but I can find out the sequence. I know that it's starting in Barnes <coughs> and queue because they were the areas that voted most heavily for it. Yeah, the I think signs are tiny little plaques. I mean, I do that. I think they need to be bigger. Day. I agree. So I, I think agree. we should also have a go at the mobile phone users at that junction too, because that's critical. I agree. I, unfortunately, I don't think our traffic wardens can do mobile phones, but what we could do is I could raise at the police liaison group next week that perhaps they could work in unison at the, at, with the rollout and do a, a, do a phone thing at the same time, because that would make sense to do a sort of big hit and get the message across. Thank you. Now, does, does anyone have any really pressing questions? Because I'm aware of the fact that we are losing a few people from the audience as, it, as the evening progresses and it gets darker outside and so on. And I'm particularly anxious that um, most of you are still here uh, when we get to the councillors to talk about ward budgets and indeed how we should prioritise spending them. So if, if there's one more really desperately important question, I'd be very happy to take it, but otherwise, Grant. Thank you very much. I wonder if the councillors could let us know, please, what happens to the plastic that is collected uh, and is supposedly recycled? <laughs> Rossi? <Rotting. laughs> um, Yes, I can, because my colleague, um, Councillor Ned Watts, who is the uh, Vice Chair of Environment, has been recently doing a tour of visiting all the recycling plants, uh, because there is a review of all waste and recycling currently happening. Um, so, although I can't personally tell you, um, uh, I know a lady who can. Um, so, can I get back to you? <laughs> and I'll ask her. Right, well, I, I think we've had a very good question time between the submitted questions, of which there were seven, and then 11 further questions from the four. So we've covered uh, about 18 topics in all. Um, and I think it's time that we moved on next to uh, ward budgets. And I think uh, Ian Craig is going to introduce mm -hmm. that now. Ask Craig. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so one of the uh, aims of this evening is to uh, uh, inform you that there's going to be a, a slight reorganisation in the way we um, uh, give out what was previously money uh, you might know as um, 
community fund and civic pride fund. We're going to try and reorient it so that we elicit your um, uh, request first into a into a single geographically focused pot, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, what we're describing at the moment as a ward-based budget. Um, this is uh, early days for this, so very much as a promise uh, we made kind of campaigning, we wanted to be more interactive with the community, we wanted to understand more how, give them more control over uh, how local resources were spent and allocated what they were. Um, so this is just to bring to your attention, we're going to be doing this, and particularly uh, at this evening and afterwards when, when we've wrapped up from standing up here, um, come back to the boards at the back and tell us how you think some of the local money should be spent. Um, I will flag straight away, because the obvious question is, well, how much? How much? How big's the pot? Um, unfortunately, it's not three million pounds. It won't um, build a bridge at the station. We are talking um, some small thousands of pounds, maybe 10,000 pounds would be a good working value to have in your head when you think of ideas. So some of uh, Caroline's ideas earlier about green walls, very achievable with that amount of money. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. But very much, this is your opportunity to say, I think this is a local priority. Um, I hear there's a pot of money available for that. Please tell us. Partly that is really valuable to us now. Because we're developing the system as we go, actually, the better quality the ideas are and the more uh, utility we can see in doing this process, the more likely and almost definitely the bigger the pots of money we'll get. Um, you have to appreciate what we're doing in effect is, is dragging the money from potentially individual budget holders, people in charge of the environment, people in charge of transport. That actually in terms of a big institution is quite a, a tricky thing to do at times. But if we can demonstrate through you know, uh, your opinions and, and really well thought through ideas, we have a great place to deploy some money and it gives us a really strong argument to go and say, look, we've got some great ideas in queue, um, they're totally achievable, I want a bit of that budget line item please that you've got on your spreadsheet. That's much more feasible if we go up to them with, with great ideas. So anything you can do to um, give us a prompt. Um, hopefully this, what is initially probably is a guide, <coughs> £1,000, and it, it, there are budget constraints, and I can't promise that either. Um, but definitely, the aim is to grow it over the future years until it's actually quite a substantial amount that could be used to spend um, in queue. And in a way, there's a little bit of a competition, you can think of it as a bit of a competition. Um, while all wards will definitely get some money allocated to them, if you come up with really good ideas, you're more likely to get money allocated to you. So the more engaged people are, uh, the more likely it is we'll get some money. And if there's any questions immediately arising, uh, happy to field them now. We have their microphone to Anne, please. It's just come out from the back. Green um, until you get the money from Brentford. So I don't know how much that consultation costs, but stores can die overnight. And if we don't support them and do what we need to do quickly, or really quickly, we lose them. And we don't, I don't think there's time to wait for consultation on parking around Kew Green, if that's what we're waiting for from Brentford, to evaluate how we can really help our stores. And the same applies to the stores down Sandicombe Road who clearly are asking for our help. So if that money, that 10,000, can go to accelerate either the CPZ consultation or something to drive business to our shops, that's got to be a priority for our community. Uh, I think that's a great idea, and we can definitely, I definitely want to um, kind of capture that idea today. I think, given it's a small budget, that's definitely a good way to deploy it. And I think JF might have, we have looked at accelerating the CPZ consultation with in-house money first, and maybe JF can speak to that, because the only solution is, we know we're getting the money, why can't we do it? There are, I think, some good reasons. Um, uh, but um, there are, you know, the green walls idea for schools also sounds like an excellent idea, but uh, that's, a, that's an excellent one. And if we could get some, uh, maybe I'd ask you, you know, you know the ward and, and North Richmond as well very well. Is there something concrete there that could actually be achieved with that money that we could capture now and then feed back up and try and seek that money? So, yeah, I understand the goal, but I think we need something quite, Specific and achievable within a you know 24 month period. Well, even the map, a 
map to point out where the shops are that's visible and can be used. Teddington have done it very, very effectively to really create the Teddington shoppers, the local shoppers, the Christmas lights, that whole concept. They crowdfunded for the Christmas lights. They really have a very energetic trading community and I think there's a lot that could be done with similar, not just as we say in the village, but all the way down Sandicombe Road and actually around um, Lake Road too, because that is our community. Yeah, great idea. We will record that and follow up. Uh, thank you, Anne, and uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Craigie. Well, I, I think we have moved seamlessly uh, from uh, raising the issue of uh, ward budgets into now talking about possible projects and priorities. So at this stage, I'm going to say thank you to our councillors for uh, responding to the questions, uh, both submitted and from the floor. And I'm going to say thank you very much to you all for asking a very wide range of uh, questions. It's been, in my view, a very uh, helpful and lively discussion. But now I invite you to move towards the back of the hall uh, where we can congregate around the map and talk to the councillors individually and uh, propose any pet projects and uh, uh, tell them uh, exactly why we think that our project should be funded. So uh, thank you all very much. Before we do that, can we just say a big thank you for Roger for keeping you all under control.